Good evening, West Coast Barbies, East Barbies, New Amsterdam, and of course, right here on the Quarantine Coast. Welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, when we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the last week or so. And as I would normally say, we live in a very dynamic, we live in a very um, changing society, and in any given week there is a plethora of events and plethora of developments which merit discussion. Um, I want to begin this week's program by uh, extending once again, as I did last week, extending warm Nauratri greetings to all my Hindu brothers and sisters. I know that you are going through the concluding stages now of this auspicious night period and I know that you are in temples right across the country offering prayers to Mother Durga and I hope and I pray that all of your prayers would be answered and you would be blessed with good health and happiness. Um, I also want to speak a little because a, person, a lot of people have called me and asked me to highlight the fraud investigation that seem to have died down um, taking place in relation to an alleged fraud which took place at Mard's West Coast Barbies. Um, you would know, you would have read in the newspapers and you would have uh, seen on television that two uh, APNU personnel um, uh, Abel Sitaram as, and I understand him to be the chairman of Mards, as well as the councillor, the famous West Coast um, Region 5 councillor, I can't remember her name, uh, she was also implicated, the one who misbehaved terribly and blocked the chairman and the council from performing their functions for several weeks after the local government elections. Um, these two persons, Abel Sitaram and Joseph, Carol Joseph is her name, Miss Carol Joseph, the APNU councillor in Region 5, were implicated or are implicated in the fraud investigations which are ongoing. And many people have raised the concerns with me that it seems to be that the investigations are dying and they want to know what is going on, why charges are not being uh, instituted against these two persons and if they are not implicated, well then the police ought to make a statement exonerating them from culpability in this alleged fraud. So one way or another, the people of Region 5 and indeed the people of Region 6 are calling on the police to make public the investigations. Tell us what, what is it that, that is going on. After three or four weeks, we are not hearing anything coming out of this investigation involving Abel Sitaram and Carol Joseph. So the commander of Region um, Divisional Command Area um, B, that would be for the Burmese area, I am calling upon you to make the investigations, the results of the investigations public. Let the people know, because after all you are dealing with public funds, and those who are implicated in the stealing of public funds uh, will have to be charged, and not only charged, but the question arises as to whether they should continue to hold public office. And, and these are important issues and that is why it is important and imperative that the public be made aware of where the investigation currently is because we are in the dark on this matter. The other issue that I want to speak on is to update you the people of Region 5 and 6 about the issue with um, our Attorney General, Basil Williams, 
Uh, the last time when I spoke, I don't think that the judge's letter was made public. Well, you know, I disclosed to the press, well, I didn't disclose to the press really. I published on my Facebook page what transpired in court on that day, the 23rd of uh, March 2017, the case involving Carville Duncan, where Bassey Williams and the judge had a particular exchange. And I made it public. Bassey Williams accused the judge of not recording the evidence accurately, and the judge objected to Williams' accusation, as a result of which Williams started to shout at the judge, saying that the last person who told him how he must speak in a court, because the judge said, look, you cannot speak to me like that. And William said, I will speak how I want, where I want. And um, the last person who told me how to speak and who tried to misrepresent what I said in court was a magistrate who was later found dead. And the judge walked off the bench. You would recall that I recited those events almost identical to how the judge um, recollected it in his letter. But the judge's letter was not made public and Williams went and accused me of lying, accused me of misrepresenting what transpired in court and accused me of causing the judge to walk off the bench. And this went on for days. And of course he was aided and abetted by the Chronicle newspaper who had the judge's letter from the inception. How they got it is a different matter. But they got it and they deliberately refused to publish the full judge's letter. Instead, they conveniently took excerpts of the letter and published it bit by bit in the newspapers so as to corroborate and to support William's version of the events. And for days, the Chronicle and Williams had the nation believe that I was the guilty party. Although I had nothing to do with the interaction between Williams and the judge, save and accept that I was present when it occurred. For days, Basil Williams barefacedly lied to this nation by telling them that I caused the judge to walk off the bench and denied that he ever said what I said he said. Instead, he gave some Nancy story about he and the judge being in the same class and he and some magistrate being in the same class and that he was reciting some event. Absolute fabrication. This guy lies with a straight face, makes up a story and tries to put the matter, put the problem in my lap. Lo and behold, unfortunately, you cannot keep the truth down for too long. So eventually, the judge's letter came forward. And the judge's letter was written the very day after the incident. And the judge's recitation of what happened in the court in his letter to the Chancellor of the Judiciary was almost identical to what I disclosed. Almost identical. War for war almost. And the judge vindicated my version of the story, corroborated my version of the story, and condemned Basil Williams as a complete and utter liar. That is what the judge's version did. And it did not end there. Williams, in furtherance of his lie, got two innocent state counsel, two young attorney, female attorneys, who were present in court with him and who are working with him, he got them to lie, to give statements saying that he did not say what I said he said. And when the judge's version of the events came out and it was on four and on par with what I said, it obviously showed that he got these two young lawyers to lie. We don't know yet 
what the careers, what impact that will have on the careers of this, these two young lawyers. But what it goes to show that this guy is going to pull anyone down in order to save himself and to divest blame from himself. Every time he loses a case, every time something goes wrong, he blames Jehovah, Jesus, Ram, Allah, the Solicitor General, the Deputy Solicitor General, the PPP, and Anil and Lal, and whoever else apparently he can see. He just blames everybody else. That is his modus operandi. And the truth of the matter is that his incompetence is overwhelming. His incompetence is overwhelming. And no matter what he does, he does not, he cannot seem to get it right. Now he is in this quagmire. And I am told that he's sending people to beg the judge. Well, I am hoping that the judge will not relent. Because if the judge relents, the judge would lose tremendous credibility. The judge has said that unless Williams apologizes to him and to the lawyers who were present in court, then he will not hear Williams in any matter whatsoever. He said Williams' conduct was despicable, egregious, contemptuous. Those are the three words, strong adjectives that the judge used to describe and decry the conduct of Williams. And if the judge is to resile from that, then the judge would lose tremendous credibility. Because this matter is being looked at by the Caribbean Court of Justice and by the entire Caribbean bar and judiciary. So this judge is being looked at to see whether he will resile and he will capitulate to the wishes of Williams because Williams is already in the press saying that he will not apologize. And of course, he got two sidekicks, two sycophants, Juliet Holder Allen, who was removed from the bench for mental problems. She was the chief magistrate of this country. You will remember her. Juliet Holder Allen, and she was removed from the bench for making some wild, reckless, and insane allegations against the then Chancellor of the Judiciary, Madam Justice Desiree Bernard, a distinguished jurist of the Caribbean, not only of Diana, but of the Caribbean, the first woman High Court judge the first woman of the Caribbean and Guyana, the first woman Chief Justice of the High Court of Guyana and the Caribbean, the, the first woman Chancellor and Head of the Judiciary of Guyana and the Caribbean, and the first woman to have sat on the Caribbean Court of Justice. A woman of that stature, Juliet Holder Allen, made some despicable and disparaging allegations against Desiree Bernard as a result of which she was dismissed from the bench. And it was deserving because she has mental problems. She has come out in defense of Basil Williams and is blaming Justice Holder. If you read, I believe it's today's or yesterday's newspaper, you will see what I'm talking about. A letter, when you read it, you see that it comes from a mind that is not up there, something is wrong with anybody who can scribe a letter like that, who can, dis who can twist the facts to blame the judge who is the victim in this onslaught and vindicate Basil Williams who is the villain. And then the other person is Maxwell Edwards, a former magistrate who was removed from the bench again for corruption, corruption, for taking bribes. And anyone who knew Marcel Edwards would know the amount of corrupt transactions that he was allegedly accused of being involved in. And these are the two people who Marcel Williams either pays them a salary or he promises them something, 
but they are now his two defenders and they are writing foolish garbage in the newspapers attempting to convert the judge into a liar and intending to convert Basil Williams into a hero. You have to be insane to be trying to do that when the facts are out there playing in the open. So we are at the stage now where the judge is about to send out notices for the case to resume. That is the case involving Carville Duncan. As you know, I filed the case and I am involved in the matter. So I, am, I was told by the judge's registrar that, because you know when the judge walked off the bench, there was no adjourned date fixed. <clears throat> and um, I have been informed by the judge's registrar that I will soon receive notices of a new date. And on that date, as the judge has said, which is now in the public domain, Basil Williams is intended, Basil Williams is expected rather by the judge to come to the court with an apology to the court and of course to the other lawyers who are in the court, which includes me. So we are to wait and see what will come out of that. But that does not, that is one issue. The Chancellor of the Judiciary, so the, that I, what I spoke about there is the judge's complaint to the Chancellor of the Judiciary. The Chancellor of the Judiciary has also lodged a complaint with Basil Williams' boss, the President, because uh, quite apart from the judge disciplining Basil Williams, you have another issue. Should this man continue as the Attorney General of Guyana? having said what he said to the judge, and then barefacedly denies it, so attempting to make the judge out to be a liar, and then blames an innocent party, yours truly, for the problem that he has found himself in. And then getting two young lawyers to corroborate his lies by lying themselves. Is this the type of character that you want to be the Attorney General of Guyana? And this is not an isolated incident. You will recall when I made it public that he was attempting to compulsorily acquire two plots of land, private property, on Carmichael Street. One belonging to the Biharis, and one belonging to Clarissa Reel, his own colleague in the PNC. He went to the extent of putting an advertisement or a notice in the official gazette notifying the public that the government will be compulsorily acquiring these two properties. And when I made that public, this man accuses me and the PPP of trying to do it and that he was only continuing a transaction that we left off. This guy is sick. I said to him since then, produce a single piece of paper to show that the PPP government had any intentions whatsoever of compulsorily acquiring these two properties, or that we had commenced the process, as he said we had. And he cannot. He cannot. But that is the lies that he goes around speaking. He got caught red-handed trying to compulsorily acquire two prime property and paying the owners next to nothing. And when he's caught with his pants down, he says it's Anil Nandla who started it. A complete and utter lie. And for that, he had to apologize to cabinet. And when Stabrook News reported that he is expected to report to cabinet because nobody in the government knew about his compulsory, about his attempt to compulsory acquire these two properties. Apparently, he did this on his own. And when cabinet, when Stabrook News published that he is to answer to cabinet for his action, he wrote a long letter cussing out Stabrook News, accusing them of lying. 
And then two or three days after, Joe Harmon said that Williams had to come and explain to cabinet for his actions because it was not the government's action. There's another example of where he has lied barefaced to the nation. Another example is when he hired, when he made a decision to hire special prosecutors. And when he was asked by the press, why are you hiring special prosecutors and you're not using the DPP office, or rather, why the DPP office not being utilized and the DPP office not hiring special prosecutors if they want to, because that is the legal agency that is responsible and lawfully authorized to hire special prosecutors. He said that the DPP office does not want to get engaged in political matters. And the DPP issued a release and said that the Attorney General has lied. That's the exact words. The Attorney General has lied that her office has no problems in dealing with politically connected matters. So that's another lie. He went to a conference and came back to say that Guyana has no problems anymore with the AML-CFT um, regime, that Guyana has been taken off the blacklist and everything is okay. Three or four days later, we understand that nothing has changed. Nothing has changed except that he was able to report to the conference that he passed two laws which, while they were in opposition and they had a majority in the parliament, they had blocked us in government from passing. That is all that he has done, passed those two laws. Because they are now in the majority. But nothing has changed. So he lied again when he came and he told Guyana that you are, we are okay, that we are off the grey list and, and off the black list. That was another lie. Then, when the Rhodesia judgment was granted, I was the Attorney General. I went to the CCJ and I argued the case. And the CCJ said to me, look, you cannot win this case. And I knew that I couldn't win it because we, we were supposed to pass amend our Customs Act. Because our Customs Act discriminated against goods coming in from CARICOM and we signed a treaty called the Treaty of Shagaramas which said that we must give equal treatment to CARICOM goods. And here it is that our Customs Act imposes a tax on CARICOM products. So clearly we are in violation of our treaty obligations. I was a Tony General, Ashley Singh, as our Minister of Finance, laid a bill two times in the National Assembly to correct it, to amend the Customs Act. They were, again, in the majority, in the opposition, and they rejected the bill. I, I, in my speeches in the Parliament on both occasions, I said to them that if you reject this bill, the court will grant judgment against Guyana because the court told me, go and get this thing amended. And if you get it amended, then the Rhodesia, the company that sued Guyana, would have withdrawn the case. That company gave the court that undertaking. And the court adjourned the matter and sent me back to the parliament to get it passed. They rejected it again, two times. I took it. Ashley Singh took it. They rejected it. And I said to them, if you reject this matter, judgment will be granted and Diana will have to pay over six million US dollars to this company. They said, no, I am lying, go to hell. Well, judgment was granted and Diana was asked to pay six million US dollars. Basil Williams, by the, that time the government changed. And another lie he spins, never once saying why judgment was granted. Going all around the place and saying that I lost the case because I did not argue it properly. 
absolute nonsense. There was nothing to argue. We were in violation of the law and they prevented us from me taking the corrective measures. So that's another line that he has told. And I can go on and give you more and more lines peddled by the Attorney General. I say all of that to come back to my original argument, which is a question that Mr. Granger as President will have to confront based upon the complaint lodged by the Chancellor of the Judiciary. Are you going to continue to retain the services of a man who has lied repeatedly to the nation? Well, that is the question that Mr. Granger has to answer. And let me say, not only has he lied repeatedly, he has also advised the President wrongly on almost every important national issue regarding law and the Constitution in Guyana. And I have pointed them out one by one in my weekly article. Just last week, just last week, I pointed out how he is advising the president wrongly in relation to how the president should treat with recommendations coming from the Judicial Service Commission in relation to the appointment of judges. In my presence, in my presence and in the presence of the leader of the opposition, at a meeting, he ill-advised the president on that issue. He said to the president that the president can refuse to act upon the advice of the GSC. The president has no such power. The president had a power like that once in this country, before 2001. And when we reformed the constitution, we changed it. We changed the word, the president may act, on the advice of the Judicial Service Commission to the President shall act upon the advice of the Judicial Service Commission. In other words, we remove the discretion. May implies a discretion. We change our word may to shall. So we remove the discretion and we made it mandatory. The President shall act. It means that the President has no discretion when a recommendation comes from the Judicial Service Commission for the appointment of judges. The President has one option only. He can send it back once and say, Judicial Service Commission, please reconsider. And if the Judicial Service Commission reconsiders it and sends it back to the President, the President shall appoint, shall give effect to those recommendations. That is the Constitution. And Bassey Williams can't advise the president properly on such a simple matter. Look at the GCOM issue. Up to now, we are going on to nearly six months and we cannot yet name, appoint a chairman of GCOM. Guess why? Because a provision of the constitution that has been there for the past 25 years and interpreted for the past 25 years without any problem whatsoever. Interpreted by Hoyt, interpreted by all the attorneys general before, Dudnot Singh, Bernard de Santos, Charles Ramson, and everyone else. Nobody ever had a problem with the interpretation of this article. And that is why we never had a difficulty in appointing chairperson to the Elections Commission. First time, Basil Williams gets the opportunity to interpret it. He can't interpret it. The war, and it's not a big war causing him problems. It's not a big war. A war that has two letters. O, R, OR. He does not understand that OR is disjunctive. That OR separates two categories. That it is not conjunctive. It is not, OR doesn't mean AND. Or means two different things. And that one word, bearing two letters, is what is causing our Attorney General and our government fundamental problems that has us in a position where after six months we are yet to appoint a chairman of the Judicial Service Commission. 
Well, if a government that has an attorney general, it has Kebra Ramjetan, it has Raphael Trotman, it has Moses Nagamutu. Right there you have four powerful men in the cabinet, and Joe Harmon, five. Five of the most powerful ministers are lawyers. Five of the most powerful ministers in this cabinet are lawyers. And if they don't understand or not a big war like ambiguous or perfunctory. Those are big words. Or fundamental, that's another big word. The word that we are speaking about here is OR, or five lawyers together can understand the meaning of OR. How can they run a country? How can you deal with complex legal issues? How can you deal with complex economic issues? How can you deal with complex industrial matters? How can you deal with complex financial matters if you don't understand the word OR? OR, and you have five lawyers there. OR, the children in our primary schools preparing for common entrance would understand what OR means and the implications and impact of the word OR. But our government, comprising of five lawyers, have great difficulty in understanding what OR means. And that is the reason why six months now, we are unable to name a chairman of GCOM. And while that is taking place, <coughs> the government continues to trample upon the constitution, trample upon the legal process, and um, trample upon the democratic processes of our country. We went to the local government elections, as you know, and the PVP trashed the APNU at those elections. We trashed them. Out of 69 and these, out of 69, 65 local authority organs, we won 49. Out of 65, we won 49. We tied in five local authority areas. Five. The law says that when you tie, then you have to go back to the electorate. Because when you tie, what that means is that the PNC or the APNU and the PPP got the same equal number of councillors. When you have the same number of councillors, it is the councillors that have to appoint the chairman and the vice chairman at the first meeting of, of the council of the local authority, whether it's the NDC or whether it is a municipality. When the councillors meet, you have eight on this side and eight on this side. So how you can vote? Eight voting, the, tie, the, the, the results are tied all the time. So if the PVP eight says that they want Charlie as the chairman, the eight on the PNC side said no. So there is no casting vote. So Charlie, the, 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 the results are tied. You can't have a chairman. You can't have a vice chairman. The law says very simple, very clearly, that in such a situation, you have to go back to the electorate and hold an election in that local authority area to break that tie. That all the voters who voted have to vote again. And the new elections have to be held in order to break that tie. That is what the law clearly says. You know what this government did? This government gets Bulkan, the minister of local government, to choose a chairman from the tied councillors and impose that on the council. Completely in violation of the law. In five local authority areas. So Bulkan comes and he appoints, not the people electing anymore, Bulkan appoints a chairman and a vice chairman, completely in violation of the law. I went to the court again and I got orders, prevent quashing Bulkan's appointment in the five local authority areas. And I got an order 
restraining those functionaries appointed by Vulcan from performing the functions to which Vulcan appointed them. And those orders are still there and we had arguments etc. before the judge and the judge has reserved for ruling. So we are awaiting the judge decision in the matter. President Granger in complete violation of the court orders which the Chief Justice of the country has granted swears in the mayor of Mabaluma. Swears in the mayor of Mabaluma. In complete disregard for the fact that there are court orders preventing this man from functioning and quashing the decision that made him a chairman. The president, in violation of the constitution, appoints the man mayor of Mabaru. And you would have seen me issue a statement over the weekend about that matter. So, that is what is taking place in terms of democracy and the rule of law. And 90% of the problem in this area of government arises because of the abject incompetence of the Attorney General. I have no doubt about that. And then we come to the economic side of things now. Well, you know, I was just talking to the manager of the station and he was telling me that they may have to close operations here because they are not getting any business. And no matter where you go in this country, no matter where you go, <clears throat> you go to Crabwood Creek, you go to New Amsterdam, you go to Rose Hall, you go to Blairmont, you go to Bath Settlement, you go to Anna Regina, you go to Port Kaituma, you go to Mabaruma, you go to Aishalton, you go to Lethem, you go to Anai, wherever you go, that is the same crime. Nothing happening. Nobody making money. Businesses are closing. Businesses are doing bad. People can't afford to live the life that they used to live two years ago. Every facet of this society completing, whether you're in the banking sector, whether you're in the commercial sector, whether you're in the fishing industry, whether you are in the, com the, the, the market industry, whether you are in the rice industry, whether you are in the sugar industry, whether you are in the carpentry industry, in the construction industry, whether you are in the mining industry, whatever is your field of endeavor, it is not doing good. That is the resounding chorus you get from people wherever you go. And I walk this country and I have a legal practice that is huge that puts me into interaction with hundreds of people on a weekly basis coming from every corner of this country. And then I talk to people on this phone and people call me on my cell phone and I do walkabouts as you would have seen last week we walk Annandale Market with the leader of the opposition. We walk, we walk Monrepo Market with the leader of the opposition. So we, we walk and we talk to people every single day. And as I said, my legal office puts me into interaction with people from Parika Bagdam, from Tushin, from Canal, from Vriesland, from Wales, from Annandale, from Buxton, from the Barclays, from Golden Grove, wherever you are, I meet people and I talk to them. And that is the resounding response, the consistent response. The economy is declining, it is contracting, people are earning less, people have less disposable income. What they used to be able to buy Two years ago, they cannot buy now. The earning from this TV station alone, two years ago, is far or was far higher than it is earning now. 
and every single the taxi man, the minibus driver, the lady who sells on the pave, all of them will tell you that. And you who are listening to this program, you know that very well. The economy, but that, what that means is that the economy is contracting. It is getting smaller and smaller. And what is the government doing about it? Every single day, the government takes a hammer and a nail and drives another nail in the coffin of the economy. Every single day, in every single sector. So you have that in education. Now in an economy where people are struggling to send their children to school because the money that they used to earn two years ago, they can't earn it now. They do not earn it now, but the school fees have gone up, so they have to now pay, they are under tremendous pressure. Then on top of that, this government, rather than come in and attempt to assist in that situation, puts VAT on it. Take the rice industry. Go across the river and talk to the farmers in Region 5. No market for their rice. The promise of $9,000 was a total cock, total lie. Promise of $9,000 per, per body, total lie. No market. Weather beating them. They impose, in that kind of circumstance, where you have no market, you have increase in gas price and increase in all the other inputs. The government goes now and put that on agriculture equipment. So every spare part that you buy, every spray can that you buy, every tract and combine for the richer farmers, the larger farmers that you buy, you now pay 14% VAT on that. So another nail in the coffin. And if that is not enough, they now go to the enemy and they say to the enemy, raise your fees by 300%. Not 10%, 20%, 300%. They raise the fees for land rental and irrigation. That is about five nail in the coffin of the rice industry right there. And that is what they're walking around doing to every single industry. The private sector calling for an injection of foreign exchange into the system. That is what the private sector is asking for. Put foreign exchange into the system. This government has removed money from the banks. $20 billion of government money which we had put in the bank to keep the economy afloat and keep liquidity in the commercial sector and in the banking sector, this government has taken it out. In the time in which the, the economy needs it the most, sometimes you wonder whether these people are deliberately doing these things. You have to wonder. Because in this atmosphere where people are earning less, where you have imposed 200 new tax measures that never existed in the country before. So 200 new taxes. You haven't raised salaries. You haven't raised salaries. But you impose 200 tax measures on the population. And then on top of that, if that is not bad enough, you bring the parking meter. You bring the parking meter in Georgetown. People are walking and are wondering if this government has an agenda. Does it wake up every day and then says, you know what? How is it that we are going to make the lives of Guyanese more miserable today? What is it that we have to do to make life more difficult for people in Guyana? Many people believe that that is the question that the government asks itself every morning. And then comes up with these decisions. I am told that they now want to close all the cambios in the country. Because they say the cambios are holding foreign exchange. So all the cambios 
in Barbies, in New Amsterdam, in Rose Hall, in Corivatan, all are doing the clothes. So you don't have to go back to buy money, black market, in America Street in Georgetown. And you remember those days, the quarantine businessmen will remember those days, how many times they got robbed as they come from Georgetown with their monies. And you have to go back to Nigeri to buy U.S. currency, as you used to do in the 80s. We are going straight back there. That is the newest announcement you will hear soon, that they're going to close the cambios, because they say that the cambios are causing the confusion in the marketplace. That is the type of government that we have. The phone has been going, and I know that I get a lot of complaints that from people that I don't allow calls. So I'll begin to take your calls. Caller, you on the air. Yes. Yes? Sorry? You cannot call this program if you're drinking. This is a serious program, and I will not tolerate this program to be diluted to that extent. So please, when you call, make sure you're serious and you have a quick point to make. Caller, you're on the air. Good night, Anna. Yeah, good night. Where are you calling me from? I'm calling from the Edward village. The Edward? Uh-huh. Okay, I agree with Now, these people, if you look back, now, you don't want to name the commission, the election commission, because you definitely, you definitely want to rig the election. But that is the view of a lot of people. You want to rig it. Now, Look at everything carefully as it does. Now, is that APNU for me? It is PNC, APFC, because this man is trying to fulfill all of Bonham's desires, all of Bonham's dreams. Yes. What Bonham has done in the 1980s and the 1960s, Granger doing it today. Yes. And, it, and I'll tell them at the day of, of the election campaign that a vote for the APNC is like a vote for the PNC. But the people of the N word. In particular, Cotton Tree, and so they didn't listen to me. <laughs> yeah. You understand? Yeah. I remember that was one of the most difficult areas for me to work. Yeah. Right? Uh, and, and, you know, the president did, did not hide his views, you know. The last Congress that they had at Congress Place, he said it. He said that I and the PNC are wedded to the ideology of Hobbes Bordon. <laughs> Nagamutu and Ramjitan were sitting right there. Exactly. Right? So the president is not ambiguous or obscure about what he says. All right, caller, thank you. All right. Yeah, the man said that, that he will implement that Barnum philosophy is relevant. Caller, you're on the air. Hello, good morning. Hi, where are you calling me from? I'll be in front. I'll be in front. Uh huh. I didn't hear you. You said. Well, oh, that's another one. In an economy that where people are earning less, where all the productive sectors are experiencing problem and are going into paralysis, where the earning capacity of the people are reducing rapidly. You go out and, and do things like banning new styles. I mean, that, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. That is exactly what I'm speaking about. They wake up one morning and they say, you know what? What else is there for us to do to <laughs> make people like Mr. Rebel? And they come up one day with banning new styles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as you know, I met, thank you caller, I will continue to speak on, on here. I met <coughs> with the New Styles Association people, right here in Barbies, as well as in Demerara and, and West Coast Demerara and Esquimo. And they said to me that there are New Styles that are coming into Guyana that are of superior quality, far better quality than new tires that are coming in from China. Used tires from North America and elsewhere 
of higher standard, lower price, higher standard than the brand new tires coming out of some parts of Japan and China. So, I, I don't understand. What? Well, hello, caller. Oh, good night, Mr. Samuel. Hi, how are you doing? Good, man. I'm enjoying your program. Thank you. But one of my main points. Uh -huh. If the PPP had did not lost this election, the young generation, I and the people in Ghana, I would never be clean. You see right now? Uh -huh. Party, the I clean as they can see from Black Bush to George Trump. I know. Uh, so everybody knows these people and how they're bad. And the next thing what surprised me, the tires them them are calling them now, them are make fancy table. If many of you notice it in seat right now, uh -huh. in design of the tire them. Uh -huh. with the tire them and I'm sell it now. Okay. Like the planning for the government. <laughs> all right. Where are you calling me from, Carla? Black Bush Fuller. Black Bush. Yes. All right. Everything all right? Yes, yes, yes. Buddy. Good. Thank you. Now, as I was saying, the same principle they came up with when they banned vehicles that are eight years and under from being imported in the country. Call her on the air. Hi, good night. Good night, good night. Yeah. Where are you calling me from? Bushlat, Bushlat West Coast. West Coast, yes, Bushlat. Yeah. Uh, Carla, all of the man is here focus on is to get at the PPP minister. Uh, we, we don't mind that, you know. We don't mind battling with them, but we also want them to focus on managing the economy so that people are going to live properly. The caller has made a point, which is true, that all that these people are doing are concentrating on going after PVP ministers are wanting to jail us and, 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 and want to hung us down. We don't mind. I personally don't mind and I don't think my colleagues mind. But we also want them to manage the country. That's what they claim they have been elected to do. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, good night, sir. Good night. Alim Pong Hamsha here. Hamsha, yes. I, I like how you, you, you speak in on television. I like that. Thank you. You know, one other thing. Uh-huh. You see when you have a problem and you go to Albion Station. Yes. They never look, at, look after you, your interest. What the reason why? I don't know. Well, you're saying that when you go to Albion, they don't, they don't treat your complaint Properly. seriously? Properly, don't, don't treat your, your company properly. Then I look after your interest. All right. Um, but, all right, caller, thank you. The caller is complaining that these police men and women at Albion are not treating complaints with the seriousness and the professionalism that they deserve. Police men and women, please, people depend upon you to maintain law and order in our country. If you do not carry out those functions, then we will all drift into a state of anarchy. So, Connor, you're on the air. Yeah. I call him from Letter Kenny. Letter Kenny, yes. Concerning the higher care, the higher care tire and the revenue license, fitness, driver's license, what are you going to do with a higher care? <coughs> All right, how much is the driver license raise by? Yeah, $4,000 now. 4000 from what? 2000 before. So it raised by 2000 Yes. Yeah. And that's driver's license, and right? Okay. Fitness was 750 now it's 1500 750 gone to 1500 so that's 750 Yeah, and revenue was 4-5 gone to 6 7 now. Revenue used to be but, four or five, got a six seven. Yeah. So that's two thousand seven hundred. Yeah, it's a higher tier. Yeah. Well, and gas price is the other new tire now. What are we gonna do on this road? So two thousand So right there you have oh nearly ten thousand dollars. And then plus you get tire now. in revenue. Yeah. And now you have to buy a brand new tire. Brand new tire. And the gas price going up every day. Yeah, so what are we gonna do? We will pass, we pay now go up, not now go up three. And the fear remains the same. same. Only, gov only government gets 50 percent, so nobody more than want money. That is the point. Yes. That is the point. Only nobody more than want money. <clears throat> you know, the caller, two callers ago, thank you very much caller, two callers ago made the fundamental point that had we not left government, then the people of this country would not 
have seen what happens in Guyana when we are out of government. I have said before many, many times, and I'm going to deal, deal with a whole program on, on the issue, what happens in Guyana when the PVP is not in government. I will, I will deal with that issue on a program by itself. But the caller made the point on which I, uh, we, we have to keep making. Because I used to come to quarantine, you know that, I used to be on channels 11, on Paul television. This television was not here at that time. And I used to say to people, I used to speak to them about what will happen. And every single one of my predictions have come to pass. But I know, I knew then, that I was speaking to a large percentage of people who did not believe me. They did not believe what I was saying. Because to them, these things can't happen again. That they did happen, some of them, they know their parents told them, they never lived under it, but they never expected that it will happen again. So, us being out of power, out of government, has given those naysayers an outstanding example of how true we are, we were, when we spoke about these issues. So it's not all bad that we lost the government. It's a good thing. You, you, you never appreciate how good you are until bad comes. So sometimes in life, change is necessary so that you appreciate what you have or what you had in this instance. Caller, you're on the air. Oh, good night. Good night. Um, Mr. Nara, you are doing a very wonderful job. Thank you. And we are proud of you. Thank you. And concerning the story with Mr. William. Uh, you know, we have followed the story from starting. We see, we listen, and we heard how this man believes. Yeah. Just arrogant. You know, and I call upon Mr. Granger. If he is listening to the floor as the head of the state. And if you are truly a Mr. Granger, you need to take this to action. You need to take action. You, you, you sign the code of conduct. You don't need people like this in, in your party. Why are you, you know, to get these people to do nonsense? This thing is not in Guyana alone. This thing is all the way in the, in the world. That's correct. You know, and this is so embarrassing to our country that our leaders, are so incapable of running the country. Why they are running for, 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 for you know, for running the country, and then they are not, they do not have the sense of humor. Yes. You know? And once more, I want to thank you so much for, you know, the more they criticize you, the more you focus. Thank you, thank you. The more you focus, and thank you so much, Mr. Nana, no, no, you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Where you call me from? I'm calling from Albion. Albion. Thank you very much. Keep on watching. <clears throat> yeah. Callers don't, and, and viewers don't think that I will ever get, you know, um, discouraged by criticisms and so on. No, that, that's what makes me stronger. No, you don't worry about that. The more they criticize, the stronger I become to bring the message of truth and the message that you need to hear in Barbies. Caller, you're on the air. Good night, Mr. Alright, All right, good night. Speak up, please. Yeah, I would like to ask for a question. Do you didn't know we can get an early election? Oh, that is, that is a question that so many people are asking. Thank you very much, I will answer it. The call is asking whether we can get a new elections earlier than 2020, obviously. Well, the Constitution prescribes that general elections are held every five years, minimum. And it is the government that has the legal responsibility and legal ability to call elections earlier if they wish. Obviously, this government will not want to do that. There are certain things which can take place, which can precipitate early elections to be held, catapult us into early elections. For example, if there is a no-confidence motion and somebody from the other side, because remember, we have 32, 33 seats in the parliament. 
So if, if a no confidence motion is moved and somebody from their side votes with us, it means that their government will be defeated because a no confidence motion will pass. And the constitution says that when a no confidence motion is passed in a government in Guyana, elections must be called within three months because a no confidence motion will cause the government, the president and the entire cabinet to resign but they will remain in office for 90 days, three months, for the holding of fresh elections when a new government will be elected. So, that, those are the eventualities that um, will precipitate the holding of new elections. Other than that, we have to wait until the expiration of five years. I'll take this final caller because the operator is signaling to me. Yes, caller, you're in the air. Good night. Good night. Uh, Could you please speak up? Uh, good night. Good night, yes. I'm from Bushla, West Coast, Bobby. Yes, Bushla. Yes. Um, the man is, see, you know, you know, you know what their mentality is that, um, you know, like, see, uh, even they're too good, so they're not going for the good to be too. They come say, you know, I'm like, even, I they're too good, so they're going for no good. Take revenge, like that. <laughs> it will appear so far. It will appear so. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And callers, this has brought me to the end of another program. This is where I have to say goodbye. And um, I want to wish you um, all the best for the rest of the Nauratri season. We have, I believe, one day, one night more. Um, and I ask you to take care. Be happy. Be healthy until we meet again next week, Tuesday, to continue the important discussions about the affairs of our country and the events taking place in Barbies and right across the country. Thank you very much and good evening. Goodbye.